As I was walking through the Assyrian room at the British National Museum, I said to myself over and over again, a thousand years ago, these carvings were ancient. Yeah, you know, I, I know it's a bizarre interest, but when I was a kid, I was fascinated by Mesopotamian history. This was pre-internet, of course, so the only outlet I had for this interest was my local library and the five books they stocked on the subject, but I dutifully read all of them multiple times. And my favorite one was classified as a reference book, so I could only peruse it at the library. So every week when my mom would take us, I'd pull it out, read another chapter, and then spend the rest of my library time looking over the several dozen pages of full-color photos in the back. Now, most of these photos were reliefs pictured over several pages, and I soaked in the detail on these things like I was reading a comic book. And most of them depicted battle scenes, and those were fun but a little repetitive. The one that really stuck with me, though, showed a building project. Now, the text box said these carvings depicted the construction of a winged bull statue, a Lamassu, being built and transported to the palace of the great king Sennacherib. You, you could see scores of figures dragging ropes, working stones, building scaffolds. The whole scene buzzed with a realism that you just didn't get in the battle scenes. You know, when my eyes drifted across this one, I could almost see it happening. My imagination could fill in the color and the sweat, the wind, the smells, the sounds. You know, I felt like I was being transported to some bustling urban center 25 centuries dead and watching the past be built. Now, at the end of this series of photos, they showed two such statues, possibly the ones depicted in the reliefs, the, the Lamassu, which stood at the gates of the same temple, right? Both the reliefs and the statues are currently housed in the British National Museum, and as I walked by them, I could feel my bucket list getting lighter. And, and maybe the coolest thing about wandering through those halls is that at the same time I was connected to this ancient history of Mesopotamia, I was also connecting to my own ancient history some 30 years ago. Of course, the, the comic book itself read a little different this time around. You know, when I was a kid, I just saw a bunch of people building cool shit for me to later marvel at in the back of some dusty library book, but... When I see the same scene now, I see a bunch of slaves being forced to piss away public resources building magical statue gods so their kings won't get attacked by pneumonia demons. You know, when I got to the end of the hall and saw the two winged bulls, I thought about the enemies of the king that were likely whipped to death against him. You know, given the knowledge that I come to it with now, it's impossible not to walk through the remnants of Nineveh and shudder with sympathy for the hundreds of thousands of poor souls that actually had to live there. You know, when I was a kid, I wanted a time machine so I could go back there and see what those statues looked like when they still had that new Lamassu smell. But if I had the same time machine now, I'd be more inclined to go back and rescue those poor fuckers. I mean, virtually no sane person would choose to live in really in any point in history other than this one, right? You know, some people might start to argue with me on that, and then they'll think about Diana Ricketts or the, or the state of dental medicine as recently as the 60s, and they'll think better of it. You don't need to apply any kind of modern bias to say that we definitely live in the best of all times. I mean, sure, if you could be a poor Somalian now or a rich Brit in the 1890s, maybe you'd make the switch. But station for station, everybody's better off now than then, regardless of when then is. And this isn't just a matter of medical science. We also kill each other less, right? I, we starve to death less. We execute our prisoners less. We go to war less. We steal from each other less. We enslave each other less. Our world is simply more moral now than it has been at any other point in human history. And again, you have to take a broad view for this statement to be correct. You, you know, you can find isolated pockets throughout history where they were more moral than the average place now, and you can find isolated pockets of now that are as immoral as virtually anything that you'd find in antiquity. But on the whole, on the average... We live in a more moral world than our ancestors. But why? You know, surely we're not actually more moral than they were, right? If for all practical purposes, we're genetically identical. It's not like our morality genes have been rapidly evolving over the last couple of centuries. And it's not like there's some steady line either, right? Martin Luther King said that the arc of history bends towards freedom, but he didn't mention that it was being bent by a pneumatic arm and guided by a laser leveler because the sole source of universal moral progress is technology. You know, in the reliefs I saw at that museum, dozens of slaves are tugging at ropes to move a giant statue into place. Today, we just throw it on the back of a truck. You know, we, we didn't wake up one day and say, hey, this slavery thing is immoral. We knew that all along. It's just that one day we did wake up and say, hey, we can stop doing this immoral shit now. You know, we beat back famine with refrigeration and genetically modified crops. We, we have more resources more widely available, so there are simply fewer reasons to kill or steal. The ever-expanding scope of our communication networks connects us to people and injustices that we'd never known to have been outraged by before. And, 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 and what about the moral issues that we're still wrestling to overcome? I mean, if we're going to solve the problem of climate change, I think we can all agree that it's going to happen through technological breakthroughs. It'd be nice if everybody decided to take some collective action, but that seems a little too utopian for plan A, doesn't it? If we're going to solve the problems of animal cruelty, the most likely savior is going to be lab-grown meat that's cheaper than raising a chicken. 
If we're going to solve the profusion of problems that our limited resources create, we're probably going to get there through some sort of off-planet mining or some kind of nanoscale construction or by some technology we can't fathom yet. But whatever it is, none of the smart money is on, we're going to pray to God to send us more oil. That's why it always baffles me when religious apologists are so quick to bring up morality. They have had all of human history to show some appreciable progress, and they failed. They talk on and on about their moral absolutes, but they've been working off the same moral absolute playbook for thousands of years. And until the Industrial Revolution came along and gave them a kick in the ass, they never had anything of substance to show for their efforts. I mean, the Christians started with ancient Rome and wound up with medieval Europe. The best historical defense they can muster are a few incremental and inconsistent improvements in morality over that time. But hey, there were also incremental improvements in technology over that same time. And however you want to quantify the two, there's no question that the present spike in morality has corresponded with a decrease in religion. Religiosity, so you can't equate the two. That'd be impossible. Look, we don't need religion for moral progress. In fact, as anyone with access to current events can tell you, it actually depresses moral progress. And yet they cling to this as though this is their last remaining stronghold. It's yet another thing that religion talks about while science does. Even when a devoutly Christian person looks into the future and imagines the wonders it might hold, they're thinking about the science. I mean, they sure as hell aren't saying, I bet the religion is going to be awesome in a couple more centuries. And that's because even they know that the future belongs to reason. They just haven't figured out that also means that faith belongs to the past.